welcome or welcome back to my channel my name is Ivana I like to read and today I'm going to talk about the books that I read in February December January February and even March have been challenging months for me mental health wise I talked about that in my January wrap-up and I think that February had its own challenges I was looking at my reading journal and trying to think of what sets the books in February apart what I noticed about the types of books that I was reading in February is that a lot of them are outside of my comfort zone so I I did a little bit of experimenting with some successes and some failures <laughs> and I want to talk about those. I think we're gonna go from books that are super out of my comfort zone to books that I feel comfortable reading. So we're gonna start with a book that I never in a million years thought that I would read and that is Call Me By Your Name by Andre Asselin. So Call Me By Your Name is an age gap romance that was adapted into a film starring Army Hammer and Timothy Chalamet. I watched it at the movies when it was first released and I remember thinking like, damn, the cinematography is so nice but I'm not really sure about the messaging. In this book, a boy falls for a grad student who is staying at his seaside villa in Italy with his family. The boy is 17 and and the man is a professor and a grad student and he is in his 30s. I was curious about this book because I saw a student reading it. I don't believe in censorship. I think if a student wants to read a book, they'll read it, especially now in the age of the internet. And I was curious about why the student was reading it. And this is a student that I talk about books with frequently. And the student was like, well, why don't you try to read it with me? I told them, sure, I will read it with you, but just be on the lookout that there might be things that I really dislike and I will happily let you know about them. And so the student was like, wouldn't you know it that I actually liked the book this book is so lyrical it's about discovering your sexuality it's very introspective it's about first love and exploring who you are the biggest takeaway I got out of this book and the reason why I liked it is because it shows us how love can make you be so damn stupid we have Elio who is like a quiet musically gifted philosophical young man who is really shy and then we have Oliver who like represents everything that Elio wants to be and he's a ladies man he knows a lot about life he challenges Elio and you get to see how Elio treats girls the way that Oliver treats him and like ignoring them and, and things like that the funniest scene by far was a scene where Elio and Oliver are in the bathroom Oliver has just gone number two and he's in the shower and Elio goes number two and <laughs> Before he does that, he was like, oh, let me look at his beautiful turd. And he <laughs> stares at the poop in the toilet. Um, and then after that, he poops on top of his poop and makes Oliver look at it. And I'm just like, yeah, like that would be something that someone who's infatuated with someone else would do. And like, or even someone who's like in the first stages of falling in love or whatever. I really don't know if that scene was meant to be funny, but to me, like it just encapsulates how stupid love makes us. There were some really beautiful scenes and the exploration of father-son dynamics was also really interesting. Trying to figure out who you are. I love a coming of age tale. I don't know if I'll ever get tired of those. When I think about this book and the film, I think about its critiques. The role of ethics in literature is really fascinating to me. Just because something is depicted in a book doesn't mean that the author endorses it or condones it. Obviously when an author is speaking out against a particular community and causing real harm, we should absolutely not buy their books and put more money in their pockets. I think that sometimes when we start saying that, oh this author is problematic because this problematic thing is happening in their book, it feels like being pro book banning. What I did with my student, we had a real book club. We talked about what that kind of relationship would mean, but we also talked about like other themes. I think that sometimes we forget that readers can use their critical thinking skills. Sometimes it's interesting to read a book that has points that you don't always agree with because that can create discussion. And I don't think that reading a book about someone who's a killer or anything like that makes people want to do the same thing. I think that people are smarter than just like blindly going along with whatever a book says. We can discuss it and we can come to our own conclusions when reading things. But again, like I said, that doesn't apply to authors who are actively causing harm in a community. And I'm looking at you, JK Rowling. I really hope that made sense and I would love to talk more about this in the comments. So if you have any opinions about it, let me know. But yeah, overall, Call Me By Your Name was a fun time and it brought me back to the things that I have done for love that 
that I have not been very proud of. <laughs> and now I really want to rewatch the movie. So the next book that was out of my comfort zone was out of my comfort zone because it was a completely new genre that I had never read and it is cli-fi. And the book is called Migrations by Charlotte McConaughey. I briefly mentioned this in my previous video because I immediately checked out her second book. So I bought this on a whim at the Montague Book Mill. I went with Kat from Lit with Kat like last spring and it's like such a beautiful bookstore that has like a river running through it and a cafe and it's just really cozy and like quaint i didn't want to leave empty-handed and so i like panicked and grabbed this i got it used i waited so long to read it i actually read this on a false snow day that we had we were supposed to get a lot of snow we got none and i thought this kind of fits the mood this is set in greenland and at sea we have a very solitary determined woman who is just wanting to track these arctic turns on their last migration the world is potentially ending a lot of it is really murky this woman is just like trying to find captains of ships so she can just join them in their journey at sea and that she can also track these turns she loves these birds and she lives for them she's so fascinated by them she loves nature and she ends up somehow not gonna say how joining these fishermen the last of their kind right there aren't that many fishermen anymore because fishing has been outlawed in certain places and it's looked down upon because there's barely any more fish in the sea and she joins them in an epic journey so what is there to love about this book first the protagonist she is so tragic she has a very sad backstory she has a death wish she is persistent and i really love that there's also a lot of action and adventure at the start i felt like it was going to be a slow book but it was so action-packed and i was intrigued the whole way through i read this in a sitting i tandem listened to it and read it physically i also love the icy hopeless atmosphere of it all that really mirrors the protagonist's inner turmoil it also had two very compelling timelines that I very much cared for. I was never bored. It had romance, it had tension, it had yearning, it had mystery, it had commentary on climate change, of course. And even though this book was devastating, it was also strangely hopeful. That's a little vague, but I really recommend this. I could not recommend this enough. It's a great winter book, but it's also a great anytime book because it just sucks you right in. This would have been a five star for me had it not been for like a really cheap plot device that was used at the end. However, this might still be a favorite of the year. So we'll see. So the next book that was out of my comfort zone, I feel like genre wise, it was in my comfort zone, but stylistically, maybe not. And it's Whereabouts by Jhumpa Lahiri. I've heard great things about this book, especially from Kat from Kat's Field Notes, and I made my book club read it. It's a women in translation book because it was written originally in Italian and then translated by the author herself to English. It's very introspective and has like some really deep insights into this woman's lives. I didn't like this book, but I did like her explorations of what she calls the banal, stubborn residue of life. It was told in vignette, so I thought that I would really, really love it because I love books that are written by women, books that are in translation, but the overall vibe of the book was just really depressing. This book follows an unnamed, miserable, middle-aged woman through her daily life in Italy. She talks about the different people in her life, like there's that married man who she would maybe like to be with and could potentially have an affair with if he was willing. There's a friend that she has dinner parties with, there's her friend's like teenage daughter, all of these people that she interacts with. She's a professor and every single vignette is at a different place in her everyday life. There were some standout vignettes, but for the most part, this whole thing just felt pretty masturbatory. Like she just wrote beautiful sentences. There's no denying that Jubilee Heary is an amazing writer. But at the end of the day, it just didn't come together for me. The people in my book club roasted the shit out of this book. They absolutely despised it. I didn't feel as annoyed by it. They just kept going back to the line, in spring I suffer. And they were like, yeah, you and me both. <laughs> Some of the questions that my book club asked after reading this book why is this woman so miserable like she seems to have money she you know there's no backstory she's in beautiful picturesque italy like 
having Cornettos and you know she should be happy she's an independent woman and me personally I don't know if I would want to be friends with her but she just seems to have so many friends so that was the other question that my book club had like how come she has so many friends yeah I didn't come to booktube to be a hater but this was just not it for me and I absolutely hate making comparisons but it kind of reminded me of a less spunky Elena Ferrante book and with that we can move on to the next book <laughs> So the next book that was somewhat out of my comfort zone was Jamaica Kincaid's At the Bottom of the River. Now Jamaica Kincaid, I've said this before, she's one of my favorite authors. This book is really really different from the other Jamaica Kincaid books that I've read, Lucy and A Small Place. This book was very 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 vibey and it is a short story collection but the stories don't really have plot. There's some beautiful imagery in this. Every single story had like bug imagery and I thought that that was really neat. I buddy read this with Kat from Lit with Kat and I honestly probably would have put it down or DNF'd it had it not been a buddy read because I felt so out of my depth and so stupid reading it. I didn't quite understand every story. I know that there was some things about mother-daughter relationships I love the audiobook narrator, but unfortunately my hold lapsed, so I had to finish like half of the book physically. I really appreciated island lore on this. I believe that most, if not all, of these stories are set in the Caribbean. I loved all the creepy things that happen. Like, there's a story that begins with in the night, way into the middle of the night, when the night isn't divided like a sweet drink into little sips. How beautiful is that, right? When there is no just before midnight, midnight or just after midnight when the night is round in some places, flat in some places, and in some places like a deep hole, blue at the edge, black inside, the night soil men come. And then she just proceeds to describe the night soil men and she goes, the night soil men can see a bird walking in trees. It isn't a bird. It's a woman who has removed her skin and is on her way to drink the blood of her secret enemies. It is a woman who has left her skin in a corner of a house made out of wood. It is a woman who is reasonable and admires honeybees in the hibiscus. It is a woman who, as a joke, brays like a donkey when he is thirsty. Do I have any idea what's going on? No. Do I think it's gorgeous? Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, it's like very dreamlike. It has beautiful sentences. I really like this. I wish I was taking like a literature course so I could analyze the sh** out of all of the sentences in this. But yeah, this to me was like capital L literature and I just, I want to read more. I want to read Annie John next. I don't feel like I can properly explain this book. <laughs> but it was good, it was good. It was just a little bit intimidating. Okay, so the next book that I want to talk about is a book by an author that I have also read before, and it is Marguerite Duras's Destroy, She Said. Now, take a moment to look at this cover. I thought this cover was kick-ass. I went to a library sale with my friend Emma and all of the softcover books were a dollar and all of the hardcover books were two dollars and this was one of the softcover books and so I ended up getting three or four Marguerite Dura books because they were so cheap and I just found them so fascinating. There's something about French literature that is just so cool. <laughs> And it's funny because I'm calling some books pretentious, but here I am saying that. I just wanted to have a good time. I think one of the other books I got had a really ridiculous title, like The Ravishing of So-and-So. So I was just like, I want to have a fun time. I know this isn't going to be a favor, but I'm going to read it anyway. And so in that sense, it was a little bit out of my comfort zone. But also what I didn't realize is that this got turned into a play and also a movie which I'll show here. And basically, this story follows a couple of people. Honestly, at this point, I'm like, are some of these people even real? At a hotel that could also be a sanatorium, and there's this woman, and she loves to stare at the void and smoke a cigarette, and this man is infatuated with her, and like this other man becomes infatuated with her too. It's set in France, and they talk a lot about motherhood, the erotic, nature, there's a forest looming nearby, and maybe they can escape to it. I think that for me, this was a fun exercise, but I also had no idea what I was reading. I honestly felt so dumb the whole month of February because I was like, what am I reading? I should be buddy reading this with someone. I did read the book or the novella, I guess, in a sitting because I had time to kill. And at the end, there's an interview with Marguerite Dura, but the interview is about the film, which was adapted from the book and I just wasn't in the headspace to read the interview. I feel like I could learn more. I need to like watch a podcast or something about Marguerite Dura and this book because I found the lover so interesting and 
I didn't understand much and I couldn't figure out who was talking because it was written mostly in dialogue and sometimes I wouldn't tell you who said what. So I'd be curious to revisit this and to watch the film, but I just didn't have the energy or the curiosity to do that in February. And one of the lines that I liked from this book was, she looks at the void, that's the only thing one looks at, but she does it so well. A tale as old as time. So the last three books that I have are books that were in my comfort zone and books that I think I fully understood for the most part. And I, the first one of these is Natural Beauty by Lin Lin Huang. This book has been compared to Mona Wad's Rouge and a lot of people have said that it's better. It's like a literary fiction horror book about the beauty industry. It follows a 20 something year old Asian American former piano prodigy who is in her 20s. For some reason, she is no longer playing the piano. She works as a waitress and somebody sees her, like one of her customers in the restaurant is like, hey, do you want a job? I work at this like beauty and wellness company called Holistic. And she's like, fine, I'll, like, I'll check it out. And she goes and she sees that it's a really big deal. It's a very coveted job. This company is making so much money and like changing so many lives. And it's all centered around beauty and organic products it's like very goopy very Gwyneth Paltrow-y all of her co-workers like look the same but they're all stunning and she's like well I don't look like this like do I belong here I read this book because I thought it would be gross and it was gross it didn't disappoint in that sense I thought it would be grosser but it was pretty pretty gross especially at the end I like the exploration of beauty and art what makes something beautiful is its symmetry harmony and symmetry in music can obviously be great but what about when things don't conform to those standards. I also really liked the commentary on organic things because you know what's organic? Waste, cadavers, right? All of those things. We as a society have like started adding like the words clean and organic to things. The other thing is like we think about the sacrifices. Like, growing up, my mom always used to tell me beauty is pain. What are you willing to do to be beautiful? And I think that's like really up and it's things that women and femmes are told all the time and so this book kind of played around with that and it was just like really interesting and it was kind of fun to read <laughs> about the stuffness. There's also like a look into like what immigrant parents are willing to do for their kids especially the main characters parents. One thing that caught me by surprise in this book when thinking about like trigger warnings and things, there was so many times when she was essayed. So thinking about the fetishization of Asian women and the constant portrayals and depictions of Asian women as docile and wanting to service others, that was also really interesting. And then also in terms of beauty giving you power and like pretty privilege and all that, the book was interesting. It wasn't my favorite. I absolutely loved listening to Kat talk about this book though because she loved it. So it was nice to see her side of things as well. She made me appreciate this book more. So another book that I read and this one was for comfort, the last two books are comforting books, was A Love Song for Ricky Wilde. This was written by Tia Williams who also wrote Seven Days in June which I really 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 enjoyed and I absolutely adore the cover of this book. It looks like a film poster, very Moonlight-esque. I really liked Seven Days in June because it really tugged at my heartstrings. It was a little bit triggering, but it just made me feel so many emotions, it made me soon. And I also loved all the characters in that book. This book was a little bit sillier and a little bit cringier, but like that is to be expected with many romance novels, right? Like you read them to feel good, you read them to laugh. The library wait time for this one was so long that I decided to just bite the bullet and listen to it on Spotify. And no regrets about using 15 of my 17 monthly hours on this one. It was really fun and just what I needed. I was doing chores over vacation and this really hit the spot. So this book follows like the titular Ricky Wilde. She has three other sisters. Her family owns a funeral home business, like a chain of funeral homes in the South. And she is kind of like the black sheep of the family. She's the youngest. She really, really wants to open a flower shop. And everybody in her family laughs when she says that, which I think is really interesting because flower shops and funeral homes go so well together. So that I didn't understand. But in any case, right, we suspend her disbelief <laughs> and she meets this little old lady who happens to have a brownstone and there's a storefront there and so Ricky has saved up money so she moves to New York City, she lives in Harlem and she like cleans up this little shop and she keeps running into this gorgeous mysterious man who, yeah, it's just filled with like a lovable cast. 
but there's a little bit of magic which I didn't know I, I don't think it like messed with my enjoyment of the book but I wasn't expecting it because that's not what seven days in June was like and again authors can write in different genres we get to go back in time to the Harlem Renaissance and learn more about the history of Harlem the book was just really romantic, it was fast paced, very predictable, but it was just a solid little pick me up. The last book that I read was my nighttime book, the second book in the Anne of Green Gables series. This is Anne of Avonlea. I'm not going to talk to you about the plot of this. This was just my little February comfort book. I just have so much love for L.M. Montgomery, Lucy Maud. I recently found out that she unalived herself and that just really, really breaks my heart. I really want to read her biography. I just thought this book was really cheeky. It's filled with lovable characters. You can always root for Anne. The beginning was a little bit slow and then I like dog-eared so many of the pages because there were so many beautiful lines. I think that the humor in this book, the nature passages, like all of that is unmatched. I think that this is a classic for a reason. Lucy Maud really knew her shit. She also kind of poked fun at editors. They kept requesting that she write more Anne books. There's a cheeky little line that I love. Anne is talking about how she likes to write and her friends are like, oh, you should publish it. And she goes, it wouldn't be suitable enough. There's no plot in it, you see. It's just a string of fancies. I like writing such things, but of course, Nothing of the sort would ever do for publications, for editors insist on plots. This book is just like a constant little daydream and it just makes my heart swell up with joy and I'm like halfway through Anne of the Island, which is the third book now that we're in March and I just love that this keeps me company. Again, I cannot recommend the series enough. Also just like no matter how many years have gone by, people still continue to be the same and so it's just nice. The way that she describes certain people in this book, I'm like, yeah, I know someone exactly like that, so. So lastly, we have our little joys. One of my little joys was watching Donald Glover's Mr. and Mrs. Smith on Prime. I know Amazon is evil, but this is a remake of the Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt movie, but it's in a TV series form. And it's just so awkward, so goofy, so fun. I really can't recommend it enough. I so enjoyed watching one episode every night while having dinner. And yeah, don't sleep on that series. <laughs> The rest of my little joys are birthday presents. The first one of these, I shared this on Instagram, is this cash shirt that Dan got me. I am absolutely obsessed. Like, look at my cute little goober. Like, how cute is he? I can't wait to wear this. I'm waiting until it gets a little warmer to wear this. It's like everything. <laughs> it's everything to me. It's my new favorite shirt. I also had friends get me books, which I'm really excited for, but I think I'm going to do a haul, perhaps. Cat from Lit With Cat got me some really cute gifts. Um, but I just wanted to share my little sunny angel. She got me too, but this one is so cute. And my students custom made me the most gorgeous Karomi themed lamp, which I'll show over here. It's still at school, I gotta bring it over, especially now that I have my shelves, which I will show at a later date. Hopefully this is the last time that I will talk to you here on the ground with the pile of books. I am over the pile of books. I cannot wait to organize my bookshelves. That might be my next video, but it's gonna be a lot of work. <laughs> so yeah, that is what I read in February. It's been a rough couple of months. I hope that if you're in the Northern Hemisphere that you're enjoying the warmer weather. And if you're still here, let me know what's bringing you joy because I think we could all use a little bit of that. I'll see you in my next video. Peace.